Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and I'm with Todd again in Oxfordshire at Todd's place. Uh, he kindly invited me over to look at some of his stuff, some of Todd's stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got here a really interesting rapier and dagger set. Um, tell us about it. Uh, basically, it's a uh, French circa 1600. Um, there was an excavated rapier in a fairly poor condition, missing the pommel, and I think missing most of the blade. Um, and then the excavated dagger, which was in much better uh, condition and actually had the pommel. So we've uh, replicated effectively the design of the pommel on the dagger onto here. Uh, the handle itself, I think, was wire bound. Um, there's the remnants of that, so I've just followed that. And then, of course, scabbards and, and fittings were missing. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, a rapier. I can't actually remember how long the blade is on it, to be honest. It's, um, could you hold that for me? Yeah, I could do my guesstimation. Well, I'd say, oh, blimey, it's, it's about that long. It's pretty long, yes. Um, 38 inches? Yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. Uh, yeah, 13, 39 inches, something like that, I'd say. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a relatively simple hilt design, isn't yeah. it? So it's relatively open, um, almost more like earlier side swords. Um, it is a cut and thrust blade and it is sharp, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, so, so I mean, although it is, you know, this is a design of sword which is designed to, to optimise the use of the point, it is nevertheless a sword which can give a fairly decent cut. I know. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I can speak for you. Okay, so tell us about that. <laughs> uh, it, was just, it was just on the polish. I had to, right. um, uh, I grabbed the blade and it was all fully sharp and then I had right. to make some changes to the blade geometry for the client. And uh, so now I'm working on a metre of razor sharp steel um you don't get away unscathed sure right so. okay yeah and and you know giving giving a blow with this i'm just watching out for your roof up here but giving a blow with this um landing on any part of your forearm or, or hand or head or neck you are not going to cut limbs off with this but you you could certainly cut digits off and you could certainly disable someone's forearm um this kind of stuff so you know i've in the past spoken about the fact that rapiers are I won't say dedicated thrusting swords, but they're specialised thrusting swords. They are optimising their thrusting capacity. Um, but this type and many other types of rapiers do nevertheless still have a considerable amount of cutting capacity left to them, certainly enough to do the job. It's not, it's not a light weapon, is it? It's a big, it's a big weapon. You know, never think no. that, never think of these in the same thing as, you know, small swords no. or epées or something like that. But you do, strangely, don't you? Well, I think a lot do, of people lot do. Of yeah. is, is, yes, I mean, it's relatively weighty. So it's just yeah. under 1400 grams. So yeah. that is what, three pounds, three and a bit? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. And um, and that's really the top end of the spectrum for a medieval arming sword, uh, historically, you know, I mean, there's there's an example in the Wallace Collection arming, medieval arming sword that weighs about that. Uh, but there's plenty of rapiers that weigh that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the rapier that I, my Self use um, in practice weighs about 1300 grams and yeah they're big weapons mm. and of course remember it's not only the static weight that's important it's the fact that that's spread out over quite a long uh, lever yeah. and so you've got quite a lot of inertia moving the thing around as well not, not to say it's badly balanced or anything like that it's, it's you know it's a balanced very usable weapon mm. but never think about a rapier as somehow a, a light or easy to use easy to manipulate um, item it requires a lot of strength and, and it does and but also it has it has weight but it has weight in the right places so for mm. instance the the pommel on that which if that was solid it would be really a weighty thing so the pommel on that is is actually hollow um again you know just like so many swords that you have a, a very dramatically reducing distal taper over the first eight inches 200 mil or so um you know and, and again the the guard on the um on the hilt there could be finer made but it, it's actually it's relatively chunky i mean the original was relatively chunky and and relatively crude quite blacksmithed yeah. actually uh and the same with the dagger um so again it's it's deliberately done they, they could remove the weight if they wanted to but they they yeah. haven't yeah and I, you know i think something that we um shouldn't underestimate with rapier guards in in particular particularly earlier sort of up till 1600 and, and sort of up to maybe 1620 um, is that they're expected to be able to withstand blows from all sorts of other weapons yes, that's so, yeah. and, and you know these were these weren't only civilian swords these were, were worn on the battlefield and these were potentially used against uh, bills and and you know other types of broader broader bladed swords and 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 halberds and things like that and you know it's, a, it's supposed to be a full hand protection for the hand it is like a basket guard um, and certainly we do see kind of dainty 
lighter um, hilts on rapiers as we go further through the 1600s and get, develop into what was the small sword essentially, so-called transitional rapiers. But this earlier type is, you know, has to provide a lot of quite robust hand protection. And as mentioned, these themselves are fairly weighty weapons that can hit with a, a lot of force. And so the, you need something to, to protect, you know, to offer yeah, some hand yeah. protection, yeah. And really, because these are weapons that are presented forward of the body um, when they're used, they're not, um, they're not held up and away from the opponent very much. Um, as, as the weapon's held more forward and presented forward, your hand is more vulnerable to, to snipes, to direct attacks. So you do need that hand protection there. Um, you'll notice looking down the weapon, your hand is exposed to a thrust, um, but really the hand is protected in actually using the weapon by angling the blade and using the blade to defend your hand. And once you've angled the blade, those bars come into play and prevent the opponent's weapon from sliding down directly at your at your hand. Same thing with the cross guard, of course. Um, the cross guard, just as on a medieval sword, protects um, the, the front line and the rear line towards your wrist and forearm. And angled the right way, it means that you can oppose someone's blade and th thrust them at the same time as protecting quite a lot of line down your arm. And of course, it means if their blade skips down your blade and comes off the side, it will hopefully be caught on these quillons and not on your body. Um, but so tell us about that hollow pommel. I mean, presumably if that was a solid pommel, it would just, it would muck up everything. Probably be about another two or three hundred grams in weight, yeah. something like that. Maybe not quite that, maybe about two hundred grams. Um, but that, of course, as is everything with swords, is, is it's where the weight is and how much there is. And, and yeah. it would utterly change um, the point of balance and the tip, um, sort of the tip control that you're going to have on it, mm. centres of percussion, all of these things, everything changes. And actually, it's not just that you end up with a heavier sword, you end up with something which just turns into a bus instead of a Ferrari. You know? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And, and so it does make a, a very big difference. And it, it, the same is true of a dagger, but much less so. You know, it's yeah. much, much less critical. Yeah. And so, some people would question why make a large hollow pommel? Why not make a small solid pommel? And yeah, and uh, it's looks, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the fact is, a big pommel like that looks really nice, mm. doesn't it? I mean, uh, to me, aesthetically, that looks nice. If you put a small acorn sized pommel on yeah. there, it would look ugly. I have to say there are some Spanish, late, much later, uh, Spanish cup hilts, which have very, very small, or sometimes almost non-existent mm. pommels on them. And to me, they look really ugly yeah. uh, because they don't, you've got a large guard and then almost nothing at the yeah. back end of the grip. And it, it doesn't look balanced. It doesn't look uh, no, aesthetically it's, pleasing it's, to me. And I think yeah. that was important to them, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was. I mean, their, their idea of aesthetics might be different mm. and I think often were. Um, but it was very important, without doubt. Mm. Um, so yeah, you get things like the uh, Southwark sword and the Mary Rose sword, which have all, all that sort of English style of basket hilt. They've mm. all got hollow pommels at mm. uh, two to two and a half inches, fifty to sixty millimeter diameter. Um, so if they were solid, you know, it'd just be like a cannonball. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, but yeah, so you know, I did that, and then what else interests me, of course, is the whole thing. Is as we were talking about before, is the whole kit. You know, so you've got the scabbard to go with it. Yeah, so let's um, just uh, sheath this sword. And it is pretty long, and there's all sorts of things we could talk about, sheathing and unsheathing rapiers, which we, I'm not going to go into here and now. But um, tell us a bit about this hanging system. So I, I, it's not, I've got to say, so this hmm. is not my period of uh, speci specialism at all, uh, but uh, I'm aware of the fact that they have this hook system so you can clip and unclip it. And Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, if we start with the belt here, and you'll have have to help me dress. Um, uh, so um, anyway, I've just taken my jumper off and we'll put this on. Unfortunately, this is a client's, not mine, and he is a slimmer man than me. But you will get the idea that that comes around, it does up. Now, that leaves you with the dagger here. So it is a left hand dagger, so it yeah. can be drawn with the left hand. So it's at the back here, and as you can tell, you know, it's not completely in your way there. So I'm going to have to hold this, but. That one will then get hooked into there. Ah. Now what this means is a rapier is obviously somewhat... It's a kind of webbing system of its, of its yeah. day, isn't it? Well, it's thing, modular. Yeah, I mean what's interesting here is basically uh, a rapier is a 
quite clearly awkward object to wear. So it allows you to unhook it and you can still keep your nice flash dress belt on, you can still keep your dagger there and everything. Yeah. So you can easily unhook stuff like when you want to sit down or walk, yeah. walk through a door. Um, but it's on a single point here. Now if I was walking, I mean you can see it's just a nightmare, right, absolute yeah. nightmare. So the way you get around that, often on medieval swords, is they have another strap which comes over your Which butt. goes, yeah, around the rear, doesn't and it? And why they do it on rapiers, um, I won't hook that up, like I said, it's made yeah. slower man. But why they do it on rapiers at the front, I'm not sure. Okay. But that then hooks onto that part, and what that allows you to do is it keeps it much firmer. Yeah, right, so it's yeah, still yeah. a bit wobbly, yeah. but you know, you're looking sharp, you're looking good. Um, but you need that at least two point contact. So actually on most long swords, they in fact, and we can talk about that uh, with the other scabs, yeah. but on most long swords they actually have a three point contact and yeah. that really locks the sword into you. Right. But that's why you couldn't just have a one point, it would just be swinging everywhere, it'd be hideous. Um, I'm really pondering now, I wonder why they switched from a rear strap to a front strap. Um, th like viewers, Feel free to ponder this, yeah. or you may know the answer. Maybe it's contained in some treaties that I haven't read. Yeah. Um, but that's really interesting. I didn't know that. So as I say, this isn't my, my period of speciality at all. So it's very interesting to see how those things go together. And of course, the dagger predominantly used in the left hand, if you're right-handed, so your rapier is in the right hand, your dagger's in the left hand. Um, Lots of reasons why the dagger was popular with... Uh, Except the pose, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of reasons why the dagger was a popular companion to the, to the rapier. Undoubtedly partly because it's easy to wear, um, but it, it does make a very good companion for the, for the rapier because it can uh, intercept uh, an opponent's um, blade coming in quite well in a way that a buckler which is really the predecessor to this can't do very well against um, thrust or not so well um, in my opinion also you notice it's a very specifically designed um, dagger whereby you've got uh, curved up quillons not all of them have that but a lot of them do which enable you to i'm not going to do it because i don't want to uh, damage the fine uh, sharpness of, of this blade but enable you to essentially lock uh, the opponent's blade between the guard and the blade, which means that once you have actually defended from their attack, you can twist the blade slightly to keep it there while you hopefully skewer them and they fail to do the same to you <laughs> with their blade. Of course, you could both get locked in, uh, and I don't know what to do from there because I don't study rapier properly. Um, but the uh, the ring on the side, I've noticed some people describing that as a protective ring for the thumb. I don't know of any evidence for that personally, but feel free to correct me if that's wrong, I have always uh, seen the left hand dagger held that way with the thumb up against the uh, flat of the blade and very often as you'll see here there's a groove uh, like a little fuller and your thumb sits into that uh, ricasso at the back of the blade. The thumb is hidden behind the blade in standard uh, grip so your thumb's safe and it enables you quite a lot of leverage and uh, binding potential with the blade against the other person's blade and that ring just gives you that extra uh, amount of protection from the opponent's blade coming down and hitting your knuckles. Uh, you do see some with a sail guard on the side don't you and bigger guards and stuff like this. Um, and very often made in matching sets, not always, you do find you know rapiers and daggers sometimes weren't matched but uh, very often they were made as a matching set like this. Well that was very nice um, actually that they were found together. You know. Yeah, I mean, I've never even heard of that archaeologically, which is fantastic. Um, the other thing to say as well, as well as a dagger being a long object with a cross, in other words, it's good for intercepting a, 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 opponent's thrusts. Um, the other thing to say about it as well is one of the disadvantages of a rapier is if you... Uh, either um, push your blade out and it's cast aside and a person closes in on you, the rapier is quite slow to recover because it's a fairly heavy weapon and it's fairly long and if you have um, sent the point out and it has not skewered the opponent or stopped the opponent and they're coming at you, it takes quite a long time to get the weapon either back uh, retracted um, or indeed if you've cut pulling it back um, and so having this to protect yourself as well so it's not only a defensive thing although I would say it's predominantly a defensive thing it can of course become an offensive thing and of course there are times when you'll defend the opponent's um, rapier blade with your rapier blade and actually passing I can't pass step here because I'll fall off a precipice but uh, passing step uh, come in with the attack with your own dagger so absolutely this can be the attacking and this can be the defending thing some of the time 
but predominantly you'll probably be uh, we're using them together and we we do occasionally also see uh, defenses where you actually place the two objects together as well um, but uh, predominantly I think you're going to see uh, whether whichever foot forward either with the rapier side forward or with the um, sorry with the dagger side forward or the rapier side forward uh, this is often going to be trying to occupy the opponent's greatest reaching weapon in order so that you can use your greatest reaching weapon to skewer them. Uh, so used together, very very formidable um, uh, pairing. Um, and this also just to say these are used sometimes to defend against cuts but predominantly against thrusts because obviously you don't have a huge amount of hand protection so if a cut's coming into your head trying to defend purely with the dagger, although it is done, we see it in Morozzo for example, um, generally speaking I think cuts you'll probably defend more predominantly with the uh, rapier. And of course the buckler was popular against um, earlier, more cut-centric cut swords. Um, good, so, so how were these to make? Were there any particular challenges or um, I'll give you one? No, I mean not enormously difficult. Getting the, the balance point right on the rapier for the customer was was definitely a bit of a challenge. Um, right. That needed uh, sort of some going back to the blade grind a few times. The other is that fundamentally uh, you've got quite a lot going on with the rapier hilt and what you need to do is you make each component part and as you add it you've got to clean up everything from before because otherwise you're not going to be able to get back in. Right. So actually the whole process of making a rapier hilt is just slow. It's not yeah. enormously difficult. Um, it's just very time consuming. And how do you find doing grip wire? Hurts fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I wish there was some magic way of doing grip wire. Yeah. Uh, because, very laborious. Well, you you know. obviously know with, with renovating stuff. Yeah. The, the bottom line with, with winding wire grips is um, you kneel the wire first so it's soft. Yeah. But it still wants to spring back a bit. Yeah. And it means that when you start, you have to keep pressure on that grip wire the whole time you're doing it and you cannot let go until it's finally locked off otherwise you wait the whole thing's destroyed um, so basically you know I don't know it takes 15 20 minutes to wrap it yeah. and for that 15 or 20 minutes you have to have pressure on the thing the whole way way through and and this is steel wire that's yes. been annealed yeah. and yeah. yeah so this has been fantastically interesting thanks Todd um, uh, we're, if you want to see more about the scabbards and the way that they are worn uh, for both the dagger and the rapier, go over to Todd's channel. I'm going to put the link below to his channel and he'll be releasing a video talking about these uh, and showing how they're worn, which is very, very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for showing me your latest uh, rapier. Thank, thank you. you for looking. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.